Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and uh, to continue with my ongoing series of radioisotopes and gamma spectroscopy we will be using a different spectrometer today. Today we will be using the Polymaster 1703MO1B. Uh, Polymaster makes a whole bunch of these little small handheld gamma spectroscopic dosimeters and we'll be using this with, with uh, a handheld PDA to connect to it to test potassium 40. Now I'm going to try to shorten this a little bit but go through it in, in still a little bit of detail. Potassium 40 um, can be found either in a rock format like this. See, this is potassium. Regular potassium that most people love and eat and so on is not radioactive. But there's a little tiny trace of the radioactive isotope potassium 40 inside of all natural potassium. It's in your body too, about 4,000 decays per second per human, which is actually quite a lot. That would be quite a significant amount of um, reading off of one of these detectors if you could somehow detect all of it at the same time from a person. Uh, and no, there's no reason to try to remove it from humans' food. It's, it would be too complicated to do anyway. Uh, of course, you can have a big bucket of it like this. It's been sitting out on my porch for a while. That's why it has dirt and stuff in it. But um, you can also buy it if you want to eat it in food. For example, um, here are two brands that, that, that sell potassium in their, their salt. These are potassium chloride salts. This one's completely potassium, 650 uh, milligrams per serving. And this guy right here is a sodium potassium mix. These are, are pretty good for you because you don't get as much sodium in your diet. You get potassium. And the radioactive potassium that's in your diet doesn't really build up. Your body keeps a really good uh, uh, handle on how much potassium is in you. And it's the same amount in you pretty much all the time, even if you eat this. So it doesn't hurt to eat this, even though this is radioactive. That's kind of a complicated thing to think of, but it's true. Now, to give you an idea, um, potassium decays one of three ways. Most of the time, about 90 plus or minus about 90% of the time, it's 89 point something if you want to be technical, it decays into calcium 40 through beta minus decay. A tiny, 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 tiny fraction of the time, it can actually decay to uh, calcium 40 through beta positive decay, which is absolutely bizarre to say the least. And then of course it decays about 10% of the time to argon 40. And uh, the reason that that's kind of interesting is that argon doesn't really mix up with most things. So when you have a rock that has potassium in it and it builds up argon over time, you can actually test the amount of argon, you know, the decay rate of potassium and you know how much potassium is in the rock. And so therefore you can calculate how long the rock has been in a particular state, which is used for potassium argon dating, which is a form of radiometric dating. But anyhow, we're going to test with this little guy. Before I test, I just want to wow and amaze you with um, uh, the Geiger counter here detecting potassium. So we'll cut it on, pull this uh, cap off, and you can see the Geiger counter is at around 60 counts per minute. If we put it up against the salt from the store, yes, that's right, I eat this every day. You can get quite a good reading off of it. 100 counts per minute, 130. 150? <laughs> Tasty. It's my vitamin K, right? Actually, vitamin K is a different vitamin than that. I believe in uh, German, I believe it's called kalium, which is why it's K40 as opposed to P40, which would be phosphorus, by the way. 250 counts per minute. And people worry about radioactivity in their food. Look at that. <laughs> it's right in the food. But of course, that's really a false analogy because um, uh, having cesium-137, even trace amounts in your food, of course, is completely different from having potassium in your food. Uh, so let me just state that that, that, that was haha, -ha, that, that was a false analogy. So that's okay, though. I made it anyway, just for giggles. All right. Well, this isn't any fun. and We need to have a lot more of this if we're going to catch the uh, gammas that come from this. 10% of the uh, decays, like I said, are uh, electron capture. The electron gets sucked into the nucleus and this decays to argon, uh, potassium decays to argon 40. Uh, that, those emit a 1,461 uh, kilo electron volt gamma as a result. And we're not going to catch that with this little bit. We need a lot more. So I have some bags of this stuff here. Uh, let me get some more. Here we go. 
bags and bags of potassium. Now, where do I get all this potassium, you might ask? ask? These are water softener pellets. They've been on my porch now for a year, so they're a little dusty with cobwebs. These are just potassium chloride water softener pellets. You can buy these at any local hardware store. Um, the bag cost me like 20 bucks, and it was 40 pounds, which is like 20-something kilograms. It's, and it's ridiculously radioactive. It's hysterical that it's just at the store and you can go buy as much as you want. I got these, I think, at maybe Lowe's or Home Depot or someplace. If you're in the United States, you know what that is. Here, let's put this, um, let's put this right here and just pack it and see what we get. Let's see what we get, just for giggles. Now, it's illegal to uh, combine radioactive sources. Like if I had two cesium-137 uh, 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 poker chip-sized sources, I couldn't put them together. But this is not illegal because it's just potassium from the store. Isn't it great the way um, things are open to interpretation? But here it is, our friend potassium. Actually, we're not, we're not actually doing very well with the Geiger counter. If I put this on a piece of paper, I can get over 500 counts per minute from just this stuff. So anyway, let's get this ready and let's test it. Just out of curiosity, let's see if the simulation picks it up. Then we'll get to the testing because that's what we all really care about. All right, so we're at 2,000 counts per minute as a background. A little of them. Let's, whoa, let's drop our detector all over the place. All right, so what do we get? We go up about a thousand counts per minute on the Ludlum. Speed that up a little bit to... Yeah, about a thousand counts per minute. Not too bad. The reason we don't detect that much from the Ludlum is because these higher energy photons that are coming out of this potassium are going right through the Ludlum's detector, not impacting at all. They, they're so high in energy, they just go through everything. Very, very common place with these higher energy isotopes. Now, let's configure the Polymaster to do a spectrum. Step one for the polymaster and for a lot of these little spectroscopic dosimeters, step one is to set it up so that it's Bluetooth enabled. And I just hit this little uh, button here. This is like the mode button. And I hit it until it had this on or off and I hit the light button to set it to on. So it's on. That was the light button, see? Anyway, step one. Step two, pack that sucker pack it in potassium. Let's see, how much potassium can we fit around this thing? As much as we can get. Arr, lots and lots and lots of potassium. Okay, you fall that direction, so fall back that way. Okay. <laughs> There you go. I'll talk about a lead testing ca a te a lead uh, testing castle. In this case, I have it made of potassium. This is at 0.3 microsieverts per hour. So you know, it's quite amusing that it does so so well. Now, let's turn on our PDA and get the Polymaster software started up. Okay, Polymaster software starting up. When the spectrum is done, I'll put it on the laptop so you can see it because you won't be able to see it very well from this little handheld but we're at 0.33 microsieverts per hour from the Polymaster. The Polymaster is currently at 24 counts per second. It normally gets about six to seven in this room. So that's, that's pretty significant for, for just a bag of potassium chloride salt. Now the first thing we're gonna do is calibration. Calibration is gonna take 30 seconds or so. And when the calibration is done, we're gonna run the spectrum. And I'm going to plug this all in so it doesn't run out of battery as well it does this. Anyway, potassium chloride is an amazing substance and you're going to find it in almost all the spectrums you do. You'll find it from what's in your walls to what's in your body, um, in your food. Anything can have potassium in it, significant amounts of it even. If you recall, I had an entire video where I went to a hotel room and discovered the hotel room was completely composed of potassium uh, impregnated walls, which caused my Geiger counter to have over 100 counts per minute everywhere I went in the hotel. And I don't know if you remember that video or not, but I thought it was pretty funny. All right, so that's almost done. Let me move the Ludlum out of the way so it doesn't contaminate the um, reading, since it does have a um, check source in it. And let me get my power plug, trusty power plug. 
Let's plug in the PDA. There it is. This thing is now a calibrated, which is important for energy because this is a device that actually calibrates uh, by energy and so on. So we want to make sure that energy is set right because this this little device, uh, the Polymaster, has a cesium iodide thallium doped crystal, and all crystal detectors, be them, be them cesium iodide or, or sodium iodide or whatnot, are, are affected by in, uh, by um, temperature. As the temperature goes up, the place where the peak appears on the screen tends to move downward or to the left, if you like. And as the temperature goes down, it tends to go the other way. So very important to keep that in mind. So we're going to set mode and we're going to go to um, accumulate spectrum and go baby go. Now, all right, I'm going to start the spectrum over again so that you can actually watch it. Start, spectrum will start accumulating and I'll time lapse it of course like usual. Lower energies are down here. This base part here is about 30 to 40 kilo electron volts. The top up here is about 3.5 million electron volts and we expect the peak to form somewhere right around here, right down the middle. So right there is where you need to keep your eyes peeled. Alright, move the mouse thing away. Sit back and watch. All right, and so we have uh, we have definitely finished the spectrum, and you can see right here the potassium peak formed. Let's pull this off, put it on the computer, and see what we can get. By the way, let's use the auto identifier and see what it sees. These things are notoriously wrong, auto identifiers. Look at that though; it got potassium forty. You probably can't see it. Let me see if we can highlight it. Do you see that? Potassium forty. Well, anyway, so I did get it right, which is nice, but usually these things are wrong. But, all right, so join me in the computer. So this is the Spectrum opened up in the uh, uh, Poly Identified software that comes with Polymasters. I could see this on the actual PDA, but it's just easier to show it to you like this because a PDA is easy for a human to see and hard for, well, a human in person to see, but hard for a person over the, the Internet and a video to see. So let's be quick about this. About this. Uh, by the way, earlier I said that the uh, decay was about 10% to argon-40, and that's via electron, cap uh, via electron capture, and that's correct. Basically, an electron gets captured, and a proton gets changed into a neutron, and we switch from potassium-40 to argon-40. And then I said that uh, about 90%, and it's not exact, it's 89 point something, about 90% of the time you're going to get a, a, a beta minus uh, decay, which is a neutron turning into a proton, going the exact opposite of the electron capture, and that's going to result in potassium-40 turning into calcium-40. But I mistakenly said then that a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of a percent, less than one, you end up with a, a, a beta plus decay, where uh, basically you, you end up with a, a proton becoming a neutron, and you end up with um, potassium-40 turning into calcium-40, it's all correct except for the fact that it doesn't turn into calcium-40, it turns into argon-40. So um, about 10% of the time, plus or minus, you end up with argon-40, and about 90 plus or minus percent of the time, you end up with calcium-40. Maybe that'll help. All right, so here's the spectrum. The majority of this that you see here, see my mouse, is, is background uh, uh, x-ray uh, um, fluorescence, if you like, from everything in the room, and x-rays all over the place. Most of it's coming from the high energy beta that comes off of the potassium. It bounces off everything, ricocheting all over the place, sending out photons every direction you can imagine. There's an obvious peak, though, right here. You see the peak? How could you possibly miss it? It's a reasonably well-formed peak. The reason it's so tiny is because the crystal in that detector is very small. It's a four cubic um, centimeter crystal, very, very tiny. And even though it's denser than sodium iodide, it's still not very thick, and most of the potassium uh, 40 gammas go right through it. They actually go right through the um, crystal and fly off into, you know, wherever they go. So let's put the mouse in this thing and double click it. All right, the energy it detected was at about 1465.2 keV. Well, we know that 1461 keV is the actual energy, so that's almost right on the dot. 
Let's zoom in on this a little and see. Zoom in. There it is. This is the peak. Let me move away from it for a second with the mouse so you can see it. See this well-formed peak right here? Then it has a Compton, um, a Compton edge right here and a Compton plateau. Let's pull out for a second see if we can see a backscatter peak. I'd have to calculate mathematically where the backscatter peak is, but it should be one of these little guys along here. That's definitely a potassium, uh, potassium peak. Right along in here somewhere, this little peak right here that you see kind of forming. I can't prove it because it's too small. See this little guy right here and the energy isn't quite right. But I would bet anything that that's a 511 at KEV peak caused by, uh, po by positron annihilation, which would be the result of the potassium-40. is the high-energy um, gammas slam into atoms, creating uh, positrons and other things. And also the pure positron uh, decay that occurs um, with the beta minus decay, or the beta plus decay. So basically put this potassium-40 for you. Nothing too amazing, but it does go off in our bodies all the time. And if you want a calibration source for your gamma spectrometer and you want one that's higher in energy than, let's say, cesium 137, because remember, cesium 137's energy is down here somewhere, right? So if you want a nice higher one up here, uh, just go buy yourself a bag of potassium chloride salt. If you have a larger crystal detector, like a bigger one, for example, like my 1 inch or my 1.5 inch sodium iodide detector, it'll pick this peak up much better. So I just had an urge to use the Polymaster today. So there you go. This has been Tom from anti-proton.com. Um, enjoy.